All right, so here we are live in today's webinar on mycotoxin on-site testing and survey results hosted by Biomen and Rover Labs. I'm Ryan Hines, the editor of Science and Solutions. Joining me today are Dr. Timothy Jenkins, product manager at Biomen. Hello, Timothy. Hi, Ryan. And Philip Gruber, product manager at Roman Labs. Hi, nice to meet you. Thank you both, gentlemen, for joining us. As we get kicked off this morning, I just wanted to give a brief overview about both companies, which are a part of Eva Group. And they approach the topic of mycotoxins from somewhat different angles. Uh, Biomin offers cutting-edge mycotoxin deactivating feed additives and gut performance solutions. Romer Labs specializes in innovative diagnostic testing solutions for mycotoxins and other compounds. I'm going to take this moment to remind our listeners that this is an interactive webinar. You can use the toolbar on the right-hand side of your screen with the corresponding chat function. That's for entering questions, they, whether they pertain to audio, visual, or technical issues about the webinar platform itself, or the content that we're covering in today's session. Uh, the question function can be used at any time, starting from now, or later on when we enter the question and answer session at the end. In addition, our listeners can vote at several times throughout the session. When I announce a poll question, you'll have the opportunity to provide your input in real time. Uh, we'll see the aggregate results over here on our side, and I will read those out to you. We're going to start with our first poll question right now. Poll question one. Have you encountered a problem with mycotoxins in the past 12 months? Yes, no, or maybe. Please go ahead and select the one that corresponds best to your situation. And while our listeners are selecting their answer, Timothy, uh, would you please remind us about the relevance of mycotoxins to the feed and livestock industries? Thank you, Ryan, for your kind introduction. Mycotoxins are toxic compounds produced by fungi. Many types of fungi produce mycotoxins, and when they infect crops or stored feed, there can indeed be an issue for animals. It's well known that mycotoxins can cause some pretty severe visual symptoms at high doses, uh, but beyond those obvious symptoms, there's an overall effect on performance and susceptibility to diseases, uh, and so the overall cost to the livestock industry is really in billions of dollars each year. That's a cost to feed producers, processors, and of course, the uh, farming operations themselves. Right, so clearly a big issue for everyone involved. Uh, thank you for that explanation. We're going to close the voting now on this poll question. Uh, we've had the results come in, uh, and let me see here. Just as a basis of comparison, we asked the same question in March 2016, and the results are uh, a bit different. Let's see here. Uh, in terms of those who answered yes, they've seen a problem with mycotoxin in the past 12 months. Last year, the 60% of our listeners said yes. This year, it's 64%, so that's edged up a little bit. Uh, those who said no, uh, last year, it was 22%. Today, we're seeing 15% say no, so that's edged down. And there's perhaps a little bit more uncertainty uh, with the last answer now uh, compared to last year. Those who said maybe were 18% of you last year versus 22% this year. So overall, uh, maybe more yeses and more maybes than we saw in the past. Uh, Timothy, uh, you know, you and the team have just completed the annual Biomin Mycotoxin Survey, uh, which covers over 16,000 samples taken from 81 different countries across the world. How did the results that you see there compare with uh, the poll results that our listeners have given today? The, the poll results do fit with the annual survey in that mycotoxins are indeed a common issue in our animal feed, but I should point out that in many cases the effect of mycotoxins may be being missed uh, if it's just a chronic effect on overall performance that's showing through. And so there can still be some room for improvement um, when mycotoxins are present at these low doses. If we look at the 
uh, survey results. We'll start up with this world map here. The colours of the world regions are based on the percent of samples that had at least one mycotoxin above a risk threshold for effect on animals. When we take the average contamination levels of the worldwide 2016 results, 62% of feed materials indeed exceeded this risk threshold. Some regions of Asia, for instance, have the highest risk level, shown in red. That's where more than three quarters of uh, samples affected um, were affected above the threshold level. While in Australasia and Central Asia, um, there were more moderate numbers of samples uh, that had that risk. For the full detail in this world map, uh, webinar percent participants will receive a link to the Biomin World Toxin uh, Myco Mycotoxin Survey 2016 report at the end of the webinar. Thank you for that, Tim. And absolutely, it's a good reminder that uh, one of the goodies we'll have at the end for everyone uh, will be that full report. Uh, in terms of looking at this year's results, how do they compare with what you've seen in the past? This is more meaningfully seen if we uh, flick through some of the regions and what happened. Uh, in starting off with Asia, we've got each of the sub-regions of Asia again coloured according to that risk factor. Uh, the risk levels are shown in the small pie graphs around the maps. And we see this year that um, compared with last year, Asia had an increase in the overall proportion of at-risk samples. The rise was seen particularly in Eastern Asia, a very high 86% now. Uh, Southeast Asia, now at 74%. Australasia, although it's uh, still at a moderate risk level, we've um, seen an increase there compared to the previous year. So it's now at 16%. Central Asia with uh, Kyrgyzstan features for the first time in our survey, it's just there at 8%. Uh, South Asia, on the other hand, already a very high risk level in the previous year, now it's up at 85%. Moving on to Europe, the Middle East and Asia now. They've all had slight decreases in the risk level compared to the calendar year previous, but still the majority of samples are at a level of potential concern in Europe and Africa. Northern, Central and South Europe were all around 60 to 67 percent, with Eastern Europe, including Russia, at 26 percent. The Middle East was at 41 percent risk level, and in Africa, South Africa at 63 percent was pretty similar to the remainder of of the continent at 60% this year. Uh, and in the Americas, we see that uh, North America, the risk level actually rose from 57% to now basically two-thirds of samples at a level of concern. And the risk in Central uh, and South America was also very high, uh, Central America in particular at 81% there. In South America, the risk rose particularly in the second half of the year. A little bit more on that later. Okay. Uh, so certainly uh, some wide variation there as we go from region to region or even within the regions themselves. Uh, based on your analysis, uh, what are the main trends you can tease out of this year's data? If we have a quick look here at um, the slides by half year, so we've got January to June first, and then July to December for each of 2015 and 2016. We'll go in the, into a bit more detail in the next slides on what some of those particular trends are, but I'd like to point out first that the 2015 early results are of course affected by the 2014 harvests, uh, particularly in the northern hemisphere we're talking about. And again, in 2016, the effects of uh, the 2015 harvest show through. I'd like to do a bit of background on some of the main uh, plant disease related mycotoxins that are affecting our crops. With corn air rot to start off with, it's a major example really of a plant disease 
uh, that does produce mycotoxins with the fusarium species that can cause the air rot. Rainfall at silking period, seen here on the left of the slide, is a risk factor. Rainfall at that time leads to increased risk of air rot starting off and of course then the resulting deoxynivalenol, DON, xarelinone, Zen and fumonisins, FUM, those common mycotoxins that are present in an infected corn, the risk really increases with that uh, rainfall period there. And another similar disease, in fact uh, two of the main species, are the same, uh, some of the same species that also cause corn air rot, but in cereal head blight it's the flowering time that's the risk period, so typically earlier than the corn silking period in, uh, in the same season. We see here on the left hand side some of the early maturity uh, symptoms that show through in cereals, this bleaching of the heads of the cereal. And on the right hand side we see some of the infected uh, grains there. Now the infected grains can be as obvious as that strong pink colour showing through on some of these grains or just simply a bit more shriveled than usual. The reason that I'm showing these slides is to bring to mind that there's, there's a climatic reason for these fluctuations that we see in mycotoxin levels. If we flip back to now some of these half year slides, looking first at 2015 we see in the first half of the year that there was, in many region, regions, quite a high risk. And this was related to a very, very bad uh, 2014 harvest period, uh, particularly for Europe, affecting those um, cereal and corn levels of the fusarium mycotoxins. North America, on the other hand, the harvest from 2014 that we still see having its effect on the early half of 2015, is, was at a lower level in comparison. But as we moved into the 2015 harvest, that actual risk in North America tended to increase. Uh, whereas um, over in the uh, second half for Europe, we started to see a lower risk show through as the harvest was relatively low risk compared to the previous very high risk. Now as we move into 2016 for these half year maps, we see a different story coming through. So as we move into the second half of the year, we see, we're seeing a generally increased risk and this has been seen uh, particularly in uh, Northern Europe and the rest of Europe in general and uh, the risk level has also increased in quite a few um, other regions. So we've got um, Europe on average going from 45% up to 64% at that risk threshold level. Um, and in Southeast Asia, a rise from 70 to 76%. East Asia, 84 to 88%. South Africa, a big increase here, 45% going up to 73% risk. And in South America, we saw basically a doubling of the risk from 37% to 74%. This is largely related to the weather conditions, such as what we talked about with the rainfall at flowering or silking period for corn, um, or at harvest itself. Drought can also have an effect as it affects grain quality and that can lead to increased storage issues showing up. And temperature in the lead up to harvest is also going to have an effect. So we see that typically with um, the results that we have in the mycotoxin survey. Mycotoxin like DON is more common in the cooler regions and a mycotoxin storage one like aflatoxins, more of a problem in the warmer regions. Even more so uh, if we look at T2 toxin that's a toxin which really needs a temperature of 15 degrees Celsius or lower to actually be produced uh, in any great number by the fungus. And fumonisins would be another mycotoxin that's actually affected by warmer uh, temperatures increasing the level. And uh, that's perhaps the reason why we've seen an increase this year in uh, some of the fumonisin levels in North American corn. Okay. So you've evoked a whole set of conditions around the harvest and growth. 
uh, that can affect the different mycotoxins we see on the field. Uh, are there any findings that stand out in terms of a one particular feed ingredient or uh, a mycotoxin of high concern? We've got a few ones that show up in particular. In Asia, it was more general, so a broad mix of commodities and also the mycotoxins, so including uh, that storage toxin, uh, aplatoxin, showing through. Whereas over in Europe, uh, the main highlight um, risk factor in cereals increasing significantly with uh, deoxynivalenol being produced. And over in uh, North America, the increased risk that I talked about with fumonisins showing through in the corn. A real turnaround that we saw was in uh, South American in particular, the um, soybean levels going from a crop of relatively low risk relative to corn um, into yeah, turning into a, a very high risk uh, commodity from some of the regions of South America. This is related to some very wet conditions at harvest in particular. So for our listeners today who are based throughout the globe and focused on different species, different types of production, uh, who of them should be the most concerned about these findings? Well, let me go through that on a regional uh, basis. If we look at Asia to start off with, We've got here, again, those maps of risk level according to the sub-regions of Asia. And in the grey bars, we also have a measure of the percentage of samples for which each of those six mycotoxins was showing up in the sample. And then just beside those grey bars, for each of the mycotoxins again, we have the different coloured animals. So this represents the species risk relative to uh, the number of samples for which the percentage was above the risk threshold for each of those mycotoxins. So we see in uh, Asia in particular then that Don deoxynivalenol is one of the main concerns and that's in all species and we also need to watch out for Zen particularly in pigs and poultry. For formonisins, the levels are more of a concern in pigs, but I should point out that for each of those mycotoxins, there will of course be many individual samples where the risk factor is there. Aflatoxin doesn't show up overall of uh, ASIO when we aggregate the results like this, but we should watch out for it, particularly in South and Southeast Asia. Moving on to Europe, Deoxynivalenol is really the standout mycotoxin of concern here. That's thanks in part to the latest cereal harvest from 2016. Those deoxynivalenol levels are frequently at a level of concern for all species. Looking at the Middle East now here, an interesting pattern with the high prevalence of xerelinone showing up in the samples. So watch for this mycotoxin in breeding operations in particular. And on to Asia, it's Don, deoxynivalenol and fumonisins that stand out here. But watch also for the AFLA levels in some of the areas. These overall results include South Africa. That generally doesn't show such high uh, aflatoxin levels coming through as the rest of continental Africa. And on to North America, deoxynivalenol and xerelinol were again the highest uh, annual threats. And these two can work together to make things worse for the animal. But of course watch those formonisins on the rise now with the corn harvest. As we move on to Central and South America, aggregated together here, we've we, we can see that we have to watch the deoxynivalenol and fumonisin levels and again these two mycotoxins can also work together against the animal. The fumonisin levels are high enough for ha us to have concerns for the full range of species including uh, ruminants here. All right. So that's, thank you for that detailed picture. Certainly given us a few things uh, to keep in mind based on where we're located and the species we're dealing with. Let's turn now to a second poll question. Poll question number two for our listeners. How do you test for mycotoxins? 
on-site testing, external analytical service, we do not test for mycotoxins, or not sure. As you're punching in your answer, uh, I'd like to ask Philip uh, if you could tell us a bit about Romer Lab's experience in mycotoxin detection. Yes, sure, Brian. I would get through it. Um, Romer Labs has over 30 years of experience in the field of mycotoxins. So over the years, we have become a specialist provider for diagnostic solutions for the agricultural, the food, and the feed industries. Uh, we supply on-site test, uh, on-site um, solutions as well as lab solutions, but we also provide um, external uh, analytical services. And that's not only for the feed of mycotoxins, but also for detecting other targets like food pathogens, food allergens, GMOs, or veterinary drug residues. Thank you for that. Uh, the voting is now closed. Let's have a look at these results. And I will thank you for everyone who participated there. Uh, just as a comparison with last year's numbers, uh, today we see on-site testing uh, 27 percent. Uh, which is about a half of what we saw in 2016 from our listeners. Uh, external analytical service uh, receiving the most votes at 54% is now, uh, today. 7% uh, do not test for mycotoxins, uh, which is encouraging to see that that number has dropped by half versus last year. And 12% are not sure. Uh, Philip, what do you make of these results? Does this match with what you see in the field? Um, actually, actually, um, I'm happy to see that uh, so many people are testing for mycotoxins. Although um, I thought that some more are testing on-site. Maybe that's also due to the region of the uh, testing and participants here in the morning session. Um, but I'm glad to see that a lot of people, 45 uh, percent, are testing or sending in samples to the service labs. Um, what we see <clears throat> on the market actually um, is uh, a trend towards the on-site methods. Um, so we see that um, that more and more people are actually using those methods and methods in comparison to the service labs. And I think this is because it is very simple uh, for everyone to use those methods. Um, and this simplicity um, actually was possible because the, the feed industry, for example, identified that um, the benefits of mycotoxin onset testing in regards of speed, convenience, uh, or reliability. So what do you mean by onsite? Where exactly does this happen? Onsite testing um, happens at the raw material reception points. So feed millers or integrators already make, uh, usually already make the first quality assessment of raw materials before it enters the facility. The reception point is usually uh, located at the gate of the facility and provides a small place. It's, it's usually not more than a small room where parameters like humidity or nutritional concentrations are checked. This really is the perfect place to also implement the mycotoxin concept testing. So earlier you cited speed, convenience, reliability as advantages of the, the rapid testing. How easy is it for a new user to test for mycotoxins on site? I can tell you it's really easy. <laughs> That's the big benefit of it. Uh, basically every, everything, everybody can do it. The setup is very simple and fast. Uh, all you need is a room with a standard power supply. There's really nothing more. And everything else you need can be provided by Roma Labs. The handling is very simple, as you need only a few procedural step, steps to conduct the testing. And you can really learn it, I would say, in about half an hour. You don't, you don't need any more training than that. When completing the test, you get uh, straightforward results, which can easily be documented. To summarize the whole procedural steps, um, we can say that we have um, three steps. The first is the sample preparation step, the second is the analysis step, and the third is the result documentation. But still, um, what, we, what we need is a representative sample. So let me briefly talk about that before we jump into the testing procedure. Sure. Tell us a bit about sampling. 
Sampling is not a specific for on-site testing. It's a crucial for any kind of mycotoxin testing, as 88% of results deviation can come from the sampling step. So it's really, I would say, the biggest error source in the whole procedure. The main objective of sampling is to get a representative sample. What does it mean? Samples for, used for analysis should have the same average concentration as the entire 50-ton truckload. And the challenge here is that the sample used for analysis is very small. So you usually use only 10 to 50 grams. And you need the same average concentration in these very diverse amounts. Some regulatory bodies like the USDA or the European Union have established recommendations uh, on how to do the sampling most efficiently. For example, the European Union tells us that, you, uh, that for a lot of 50 tons of cereals, you should take 10 plus incremental samples of about 100 grams each. And additionally, you should uh, use some helpful equipment like a grain probe or dryer. Um, for reaching into the bulk. CHIPSA, which is the Grain Inspection, Packer Stockyards uh, and Stockyards Administration of the United States Department of Agriculture, the USDA, um, helps us with establishing some sampling patterns for each uh, type of carrier. This example shows um, a flat bottom truck where it's recommended to take nine subsamples. Uh, on the left picture, you see uh, this truck and this red lenses indicate uh, the equipment, the sampling equipment, like um, the grain probes, and it shows you how you should use it. So it's recommended um, to dig them into the truck in a about 10 degree angle, angle, and that's because you want to reach also the corners of the truck. Um, the red crosses on the right picture shows you the places where you should dig in with the probe dryers. Um, so it shows you ten red, uh, nine red uh, crosses that show you where to take the subsamples from. So that's a very clear illustration of exactly where to go and where to dig through to get a representative sample. Once we have that, uh, what happens next? Again, as I mentioned before, we have these three steps, the sample preparation, the analysis, and the result documentation. And the first thing we start with is the sampling, sample preparation. So what we need to do now is to extract the mycotoxin from the grain kernel into the liquid to make it accessible for the analysis. In the past, this was done with hazardous orga organic solvents like methanol. But now Romalab's uh, Vortex technology allows for mycotoxin extraction using only water in combination with an environmentally friendly, environmental friendly buffer bag. And the big benefit here is that uh, this makes the purchase, handling and disposal of organic solvents like methanol obsolete. This technology also enables us to analyze uh, four mycotoxins, which is aflatoxin, deoxynivalenol, seralenone, and fumonisin from the same sample extract, from one same sample extract. And this is tremendously reducing the testing time. So here is how it works. You simply add your sample, a buffer bag, and bottled water. That's enough. You don't need distilled water or any special treatment for that. Bottled water is okay. And put it into the filter bag. You shake it. You let it settle. Um, filter. Uh, and buffer bags are provided with the kits, so there's no need to purchase anything in extra because the World Pack bag uh, provides an integrated filter. It's also not necessary to do anything uh, additionally, like filtration or centrifug uh, centrifugation or anything. The second step, then, is the analysis of the sample. And this takes place um, on a dipstick comparable with the pregnancy tests. So this kind of strip test, um, is put in the diluted sample extract and that is put in the incubator for three minutes. Then the analysis is completed after these three minutes and the results can be quantified in a reader within seconds. Last but not least, uh, we read and document the results. The display, of, uh, the display shows a concentration value like 
PPB, in parts, per, parts per billion, which allows you to assess the quality of your raw material. Uh, results can then also be documented either by the AgroVision agri printer, you can simply do a printout, or you transfer the result to a computer. Um, and here we have the AgroVision data view software. Um, and this, is, this also allows you to um, make really easy data handling by saving it um, or having an output in a text or Excel format. Great. Thank you for walking us through that. Uh, looks like it's, it's as easy as one, two, three, and on top of it, eco-friendly. Uh, we've had a lot of requests, a lot of questions coming in already in today's session. Uh, a lot of people are looking to get started, uh, asking how to implement their own on-site testing program. Would you have any advice for them? Actually, yes. Um, I have two pieces of advice for you, which are for me the most important that I want to, that I want, that I want to tell you. Um, the first is that testing at reception points uh, is conducted in very rough and highly diverse environments. So um, what I want to advise is to keep an eye on the temperature. Strip tests are immunological tests and they rely on the reaction of antibodies with mycotoxin molecules. And this reaction is highly influenced by the temperature. So um, tests are developed uh, to work, they are developed to work in defined temperatures, but what is happening on site um, is that you are faced with very different temperature conditions. So what we advise is to use an incubator uh, with a strip test that really guarantee accurate results. The second thing I want to advise is to um, keep your equipment clean. When testing on site, uh, you often fight with these harsh conditions like dust and dirt and so on, and this can affect the optical system of those readers that really give you the results later on. It really, um, if this dirt um, infiltrates the reader, um, it can lead to a drop in accuracy, and that's the problem here. So keep your equipment clean um, and, um, and, and see that you don't get the dirt in the air. What is the big benefit of this aggravation reader is that you can easily open it on the underside and just use the brush to clean the optical system. And this is really the only reader on the market that allows to do so. Great. Thank you for those two tips. Uh, you certainly generated uh, some real interest here in Watex and the three-step process you've detailed. Hopefully we'll get to a few more of those questions later on when we introduce the Q&A. But for now, we're going to turn to our third and final poll question. Poll question number three is, in the past 12 months, which mycotoxin mitigation methods have you used? Now here, multiple choices are allowed. I'd just like to signal that to our audience. If you use several of the approaches, a combined approach, you can go ahead and select that. Please go ahead and answer, enter your answer or answers now. And we have those answers coming in right now, streaming in. It looks to be neck and neck for the first three for now. We're going to keep the voting open for just 10 more seconds. As those are tallied, I'm already going to flip to a reminder of what we saw last year. Okay, voting is now closed. Thanks to all of you who participated. Uh, let's have a look here at the results. Uh, so on screen, what you're seeing is the last year's results. And we see a bit of difference from what we're getting today. In terms of those who opted for the mycotoxin binder, uh, we see 38% today versus 45% uh, last year. A multi-strategy mycotoxin deactivator picked up 4% uh, from 29% last year to 33% this year. Uh, quality control and feed management stayed roughly even, 42% uh, this year versus 44% last year. Uh, mycotoxins not being an issue for us also remain stable, 10% uh, now versus 
9% 12 months ago. And currently looking for a solution, 12% of you today versus 16% in the past. So there's still an interest in picking, I guess, the right single strategy or strategies. Uh, Timothy, what do you think of these results? Well, Ryan, I, I think we see a good trend there. Um, the move towards multi-strategy, mycotoxin deactivation in particular. Even if you select a proven and reliable binder, you've still only solved part of the problem. And the most common mycotoxin in our annual survey, for instance, was deoxynivalanol. And DOM is simply not able to be reliably bound. We need to add a couple more strategies on to mycotoxin risk management to make sure that we address these less bound mycotoxins. So which other strategies are available? In our Mycofix approach, we have three strategies brought together. Biotransformation, that's the power of microorganisms and enzymes to reliably and rapidly break down mycotoxins. Adsorption, that's the binding part, that's making sure that we have the right binder there for those bindable mycotoxins. And bioprotection, to help protect the liver and immune system from the effects of mycotoxins. And we have the science and the European Union decisions behind us to provide assurance of that product. There's a few of the certificates um, showing up there. These aren't just certificates though. This authorization from the European Union also shows that each component has gone through a full process of efficacy, safety and specificity testing. I'll start with the binding part down in the uh, bottom left here, adsorption. The right choice of binder is very important. In our range, we have a specially selected bentonite. It's proven by going through that full process of authorization, and that did include safety, and as I mentioned before, specificity. It's very important to make sure that you're at attracting on, binding, and keeping bound on those mycotoxins that you're after and not having a, an unwanted effect on nutrient uptake, for instance. Rigorous testing was not just in the laboratory, but also proven in real farm conditions. We want to be specific and also as effective as possible because that means that you're able to achieve good results at strategic levels of adding in the product. Um, so that you don't reduce that nutrient uptake or interfere with, uh, for instance, vet medicines. The biotransformation part of Microfix, that includes Biomin uh, BBSH 797, addressing all types of trichothecenes. So that includes the deoxynivalanol and T2 toxin that we were seeing before. And the specific enzyme, Thumzyme, that's for breaking down of hemonocins. Serelanone is also targeted by biotransformation and Microfix products. Part of achieving the EU authorization for these biotransformation aspects was proving that the approaches are effective at degrading the target mycotoxins and that what they're degraded into are compounds of low or, in fact, no toxicity. Biomin leads this technology worldwide thanks to a true commitment to research and development. There was good news already this year that these components of Microfix, Biomin BBSH and the Firmzyme have now all received positive opinions from EFSA for use in poultry. This adds on to authorizations for swine already. Biomin remains the only company to have achieved EU authorization for this biotransformation approach. All right, so looking at these three different strategies, a broad spectrum approach, if you will. Uh, and then taking, on the other hand, the latest survey data from the Biomin Mycotoxin Survey. Uh, what would the survey suggest then about the choice of strategy that's best for using in the field in these different regions as you've detailed for us today? The survey results show fluctuation that's not really so easy to predict. With different mycotoxins, and often several mycotoxins at once, increasing the risk to the animal. And with some of the most common mycotoxins being poorly bound, it really highlights the importance of a scientifically valid approach to broad mycotoxin management that includes proven biotransformation. 
Great. Now, when a mycotoxin screen report shows no or low contamination, uh, does that mean that there's no cause for concern? It's still best to use caution, so a base level of uh, product being put in for protection. As Philip mentioned previously, sampling is a very important aspect, and it remains possible that the sampling has missed a problem area of the feed or some feed that wasn't tested. The testing may also miss uh, some types of mycotoxin forms, including masked ones, that were not tested for. Here's an interesting example as well that helps illustrate how the effect of low mycotoxins can still predispose animals to the effect of other factors. So we see here a, a trial in France with broilers, and there was low levels of mycotoxins present, but there was an E. coli risk that had been identified on the farm. Those levels of mycotoxins, B. trichothecenes, that includes uh, deoxynivalenol, the DOM, the common one showing up, and uh, fumonisins and xarelinone were all found in the feed, but at levels well below what we would call the regulatory levels or guideline levels for those mycotoxins. Yet there were still excellent results in this trial with mycotoxin um, deactivator, mycofix select being used. The results it was a 4.3 to 1 return on investment for use of the product with a final body weight effect showing through. We can see the Microfix uh, treatment in the green there and the age corrected body weight advantage it gave a, a 64 grams uh, benefit for the use of the product at those low mycotoxin levels. There's more and more literature that's coming out establishing the effect of mycotoxins below and in some cases well below the regulatory levels. Here's another slide here, this time looking at the effect of the mycotoxins, the oxynivalenol and fibromonisin, at, again below regulatory and guidance levels, on lesions seen in the liver, liver that's on the left, and in the um, small intestine shown on the right here. The control in grey showed very low lesions. Whereas both DOM in blue and FUM in purple caused lesions in the liver and intestine. Liver lesions were markedly worse when the combination of mycotoxins, so both deoxynivalenol and fumonisins together, as shown in green, was present. We need to be concerned with these multiple occurrences of mycotoxins. A bit more research here, this time on the response to vaccines when there's low levels of mycotoxin present. So again, the mycotoxin levels were below regulatory and guideline uh, levels. This slide shows the development of antibodies, the anti-ovalbumin uh, IgG antibody response. Um, we've got the second uh, vaccine being administered, just where that red arrow is. The control in grey shows and that's with no significant mycotoxins being present, that shows good antibody development. But to some extent DOM in blue, and more clearly even, fumonisins in purple reduced the vaccine response. Again, the worst response though was when the presence of both DOM and FUM were in the feed. On the subject of multiple mycotoxin occurrence, and also that analysis may not be picking up all the mycotoxins present, here are some results from our Spectrum 380 sampling. So over 1,380 feed samples were analysed in this advanced LCMS-MS method that measures over 380 mycotoxins and secondary metabolites. On average, 28 metabolites were found in each sample. Nine out of 10 samples had fusarium or aspergillus toxins or both detected, and 94% of samples had more than 10 of the metabolites detected. These are the sort of things we need to consider with low or even no levels of mycotoxins showing through on a feed test result. Mycotoxins that weren't tested for, multiple mycotoxins being present, increasing the effect of uh, the other mycotoxins, and interactions with disease susceptibility as well.
and the effect of vaccines is a further added thing that people might not be thinking of. We also need to be aware of the effect of mycotoxins on intestinal conditions that may not be obvious from the outside, but can still affect animal performance. Great. Uh, thank you for sharing those uh, field and scientific results with us here. Uh, you've certainly given us a lot of different aspects to consider uh, when it comes to mycotoxins. Uh, we've had questions pour in today, and we're going to get to those shortly. Uh, but before we do, because of all of the interest generated, I wanted to point our listeners to a couple of resources on the topic. Uh, first, the MycoFix app from Biomin is available for Apple and Android devices. This enables you to stay up to date with the latest data from the Biomin Mycotoxin Survey. You can receive it on your mobile device. Secondly, as Philip mentioned, the importance of sampling. Uh, if you go to romerlabs.com, you'll find further information on the Watex product he's described, along with the sampling guide that's here. And now, Philip and Timothy, I'd like to open the questions. Uh, thank you both for your presentation so far. Uh, Philip, I'll start with you. Uh, what can you tell us about the recent launch of Watex for Fumonisense? What kind of response have you seen on the market? Well, Ryan, <clears throat> actually, we have observed a um, very strong pull from the market towards this new product. Um, and I'm really happy to say that uh, we also got very positive feedback about it. It's really a nice product um, that is working very fine. Um, so this is one um, one reason is for sure the performance that we saw this strong pull and, and feedback. Um, but another reason um, might be the, the fact that Tim mentioned that we had a quite um, a lot of full monitoring contamination um, in some areas of the world. For example, in the United States, um, where we saw an increase of full monitoring, um in corn. Okay, Timothy, a question for you. Can a mycotoxin deactivating product diminish the vitamin or nutrient content of feed? Uh, yes, that is indeed something that needs to be assessed with any binder approach to mycotoxin management. There are certainly some binders which could reduce vitamin uptake at recommended use rates. This is one of the advantages of using a proven and specific uh, binder, one that's effective enough to ensure a good result and moderate inclusion rate. Uh, this has been uh, fully assessed in the case of Microfix and cleared for use by uh, EU authorization process, the full process that Microfix went through. Great. Philip, uh, back to testing. How long does it take to get a result from a rapid test? We heard it is really fast, <laughs> but we didn't tell the number. Um, so I can tell you now that you can do one test um, with time below nine minutes. So. Uh, you're, you're finished under nine minutes, and that's from sample preparation until really printing out the results. Okay, ten minutes or less, perfect. Uh, we have a question here about the ability evaluating MycoFix and its ability to biotransform mycotoxins in the animals in vivo. Uh, Timothy, can you tell us about that? Uh, good question again, and one of the reasons why developing of a proven, reliable, and effective biotransformation technology really does require strong investment in research and development. In many cases, biomarkers have to be developed once that we can show what's happening within the animal and really pinpoint that it's related to uh, dealing with that mycotoxin and the mycotoxin's effect. Sometimes sensitive analytical techniques, uh, methods have to be uh, developed and validated as well. So it's really a strong research and development requirement. Great. We have a question here about on-site testing of finished feed. Uh, Philip, is it possible? to conduct on-site testing of finished feed. Anything to keep in mind there? That's a good question. Um, I'm happy to, to go into a bit more of detail here. Um, because we recommend to apply the rapid tests, like the strip tests, with the incoming raw materials that are used for finished feed production, and not really for the finished feed itself. And I can tell you why. Uh, the reason is that the nutritional composition of 
commodities vary. Like you have another nutritional composition, composition in corn and then to soybean, for example. And therefore, um, there exist different protocols for these various commodities. So when testing for feed, the tricky part is that the feed composition uh, from the raw, raw commodities vary with market price, they vary with season and origin. The outcome is that you have a huge variability uh, in feed compositions. So it is not possible to have one protocol for all different kinds of feed. And that's why we recommend um, to, to, to test for the raw materials that go into the finished feed formulation. All right. Something worth keeping in mind there. Uh, we have a question from Susanna, I hope I'm saying that right. What is the mycotoxin contamination of silages this year in Ireland and UK? Timothy. Uh, we did see that there was a, a deoxynevalanol risk showing through in the corn silages that were um, prepared there. That's not too surprising given that uh, the ingredients going into it are going to have been affected by the fusarium air rot uh, fungi in the first place. This um, presence of the type B trichothecin typically stays the same from the initial materials that go in at the start to what you find after the ensiling process. But what also happens in silages is something that's not really seen in the main survey results that we presented, and this is other types of mycotoxins that are produced by mold fungi that take advantage of the opportunity. So they're able to grow in silage conditions, especially if the conditions of the silage are not quite right, not quite ideal. So it hasn't been packed fully. Uh, there's something compromising the integrity of the cover over that silage, or if the material in the first place was a bit drier than optimum, then those mold fungi are more likely to grow. Many of them are very common in silages and they produce a great variety of mycotoxins that we do pick up on the spectrum uh, 380 analysis. Some of the very common ones like tenuazonic acid or uh, citronin showing through or gliotoxin, they're ones that uh, it's really important to have a, a base strategy with the bioprotection effect in there to make sure that the effect on the liver is not going to be um, as bad as it would have been otherwise. In the cases of some of the other mycotoxins that we've also found coming through commonly in uh, silages, I'd bring up an example, specific example of the cormorans. These cormorans, they're produced by fusarium fungi, so you commonly find them in conjunction with deoxynevalanol. They're not very toxic in their own right, but it does appear that they increase the toxicity, the effect on the animal of the deoxynevalanol itself, making it all the more important that you're um, having a, a good enough effect on the effect of deoxynevalanol within the animal. All right, so there you've really uh, painted a landscape of a whole set of mycotoxins beyond the, let's say, the main six that we t typically talk about and that are found in the survey, there are plenty of others to be found there. Yes, that's right, Brian. Okay. I think we have time for one more question. Um, let's go back to you, Philip. Uh, compared to the other testing methods available, uh, how accurate are test strips? Yeah. Um, so. Before uh, the introduction of the strip tests, um, the technology of choice was ELISA testing. Um, and strip tests use the same uh, technology principles. So they are also antibody-based uh, and, and antibody based technology. And therefore, they are really comparable in terms of accuracy with ELISA tests. So you can say uh, the performance here is really equal. Um, additionally, strip tests are calibrated against those um, reference methods like HPLC or LCMS-MS. Um, the most important thing to consider in terms of inaccuracy when it comes to strip test is uh, the matrix effect. Therefore, uh, we need to understand that validations of different commodities, this is the same topic we had with the feed formulations, um, is of really high, high importance um, when we deal with strip test, but it's the same importance when we, uh, this has the same importance when we do testing with ELISA tests as well. 
Um, you can dive more into this specific topic um, in our new spot on magazine. We have all the details and the final explanation about that in there. That's great. I'm glad that you brought that up, Philip. Uh, and we did say that was going to be the last question. Uh, we received hundreds of questions during today's session, uh, so I want to thank you for everyone who's shown an interest. Uh, clearly, in the interest of time, we won't be able to answer them all right now, uh, but we will be treating those questions that have come in uh, and putting them up on the respective websites. So look to biomin.net and romerlabs.com. Uh, we will reach out to you uh, when those are posted and so that you can find back answers to your specific questions. As Philip has just mentioned, um, Spot On Magazine, special issue on mycotoxins, I believe, um, is one of the things that you'll be receiving in the next 24 hours um, in the to the email address that you registered upon registering for this webinar. In addition, uh, you'll receive an advanced copy of the brand new uh, Biomin World Mycotoxin Survey 2016 uh, that has just been finished. Uh, as soon as we close today's session, you'll be prompted uh, to complete a short survey on today's webinar. I would ask that you please take the two minutes to uh, give us your feedback. Uh, in doing so, you help us to improve our webinar program and also to identify potential future topics for discussion. Uh, I want to thank our listeners and our guests. Gentlemen, thank you. Ryan. Thanks, Ron. And we'll see you next time.